Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Our first guest lost his son in the war with Iraq in Basra in 2007. Despite this, he continued to support the war and the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. So much did Mr. Blair value his ongoing support that just a few weeks ago and 10 years after his son's death, Mr. Blair invited him to his Grosvenor Square headquarters opposite the American embassy. But a funny thing happened to our guest on the way to the studio. He read Gordon Brown's latest book. In Mr. Brown's surprisingly little noticed new book, he reveals that after leaving office and indeed after the close of the Chilcot inquiry, luckily for some, he received a leaked document from inside the US government at the highest levels, proving that Washington knew from the start that Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction, thus rendering Mr. Blair's legal and political case for the war null and void. This revelation has had a profound effect on our guest Bill Stewartson, and no wonder, it meant his son died on a lie. Bill Stewartson, welcome to the Sputnik. Uh, this is a painful subject for you. Uh, your book uh, vividly makes clear the impact on the lives of you and your family of your son's so tragically early death in the war in Iraq. This revelation in Gordon Brown's book, how much of an impact has it had on you? It's difficult to put that in few words, George, but uh, it's turned everything that led up to that particular day upside down in my mind. And it's one of those things that I never thought would happen. And I'm not sure I'm supposed to carry on without resolving it, George. It's not just that you lost your son. It's that you remained a supporter of the war and you trusted in Tony Blair. So much uh, so that he, he kept in touch with you, he invited you uh, unexpectedly out of the blue. We'll come to why that might have been, uh, to come down and see him. He wanted to stay on side with you because, unlike some other service families, uh, you never turned against the war. And thus, the sense of betrayal must be even greater. It may well be easy to view me as naive or easily led, but I've always been one for accepting the words of eminent people in prominent places. Mm. And I've carried that along for 11 years and been the voice in the wilderness. And to read that book of Mr. Brown's and see that I've been conned is the second biggest shock I've had in my life. You already know about the first one. So in that period, nothing else even triggered or changed your mind a little bit, made you doubt a little bit about the cause of the war? Absolutely not. And to put that into graphic context, me and Alex sat and discussed the conflict and me and him saw eye to eye and agreed that it was correct to try and be a part of stopping people being butchered. He was honourable. I like to think I am. I've got an awful suspicion certain people in high places can't look in the mirror and say that. No. I can. Well, you see, if, as uh, the document that Mr Brown has, I know that he has it, it's not speculation, uh, if, if, if that document was known to the US government, w there are only two uh, possible uh, alternative conclusions that we can draw from it. The first is that George Bush fooled the Oxford-educated Tony Blair and allowed him to carry on talking about WMD to the British Parliament, to Her Majesty the Queen, to the armed forces, to the British public, to the international public, allowed him to carry on uh, talking about the clear and present danger, 45 minutes and all that, when he knew that it wasn't true, uh, or, alternatively, the Oxford-educated Mr Blair knew at least as much as the imbecile George W. Bush knew, and that therefore Mr Blair was consciously lying to all these people. I know which option uh, I prefer, uh, because I know Mr Blair uh, for decades. Uh, which is your preferred alternative option? I haven't got a preferred option, George, other than having the truth fully revealed, because I am now left 
with two former prime ministers at direct polar opposites with each other, and my son remains dead. I want the truth, I don't care what it is, although I can't see Mr Brown, he hasn't got the motivation. People have dismissed it as a fit of pique in his book to get back at Tony Blair, mm. which conveniently omits the input from Sir Christopher Mayer, and it's starting to look a little bit dodgy for somebody. And it's about time that these people were taken to public account. Why didn't Chilcott dig this up, George? Yes, exactly. Well, uh, let's I'm, talk I'm about... With that. I, I don't understand that. A multi-million pound two-year inquiry, whatever it was... You had eight. Sorry, <laughs> m yeah. my apology. Yeah. I'd have dug it up in that time for one cent of the money. Somebody's hiding something. Yes. And in all honesty, I don't know who it is. Well, look, uh, Gordon Brown is, uh, whatever mistakes he's made uh, politically, and there have been, uh, he's a very honourable person. Uh, and I have known him most of my life. Uh, but leave aside the issue of Brown versus Blair, Sir Christopher Mayer was as close as two peas in a pod to Tony Blair. Tony Blair appointed him the British ambassador in Washington. Mm. He has never uh, once uh, broken with Tony Blair, but he has had no choice but to uh, second Gordon Brown in the sense that he knows about that document too. He has seen that document too. So, uh, as you say, the balance is beginning to shift, even if you're neutral in the Brown versus Blair affair, isn't it? I've tried to be even-minded and fair for 11 years. I've been the voice in the wilderness. I've had some harsh things thrown at me for not jumping on the tabloid media bandwagon because I've always believed in the truth. Nothing's changed. It's the truth that's changed, George, not me. Mm. As long as my son remains dead, that won't happen. And a question I'd like to ask through this medium what are the British media playing at now, in light of this revelation? Why does nobody know about it, George? Yeah, exactly. There's got to be a reason for that. And that makes me even more suspicious again. Well, uh, you're right to say that nobody knows about it. You've been on my radio show, now you're on my television show. But you should be on everybody's show. And the book should be being discussed on every news bulletin. Uh, Gordon Brown should be out proselytizing for it instead of dodging all interviews about it. Yeah. Precisely, actually, because he doesn't want to be drawn into a punch-up uh, with Tony Blair. Have you asked for a meeting with Gordon Brown to discuss it? Would you like to ask him now? I would dearly value the opportunity to represent my son and have a discussion with Mr Brown or anybody else involved in this saga on a face-to-face -face basis. I've worked in warehouses and hospitals as a porter. They're very well-educated, eminent people, and I remain open and able to sit opposite them and go through this any time, any place, anywhere, George. Well, Gordon, I've known you for almost uh, 50 years. Uh, I'm asking you on behalf of Bill Stewartson, whose son gave his life's blood in the Iraq war. He's asking you for a meeting. I think you should give him one now. Why do you think Tony Blair, suddenly, out of the blue, 10 years after Alex's death, asked you for a meeting? Why might that have been? Well... And what was it going to be about? <laughs> it, it's probably wise at this point to bear in mind that Mr Brown's book hadn't been mentioned because it hadn't been published at that time. Again, I'm going about me normal, everyday business. A letter turns up from Tony Blair. What else am I supposed to think? I genuinely accepted that letter as a nice thing to do because I'd never, as I mentioned previously, made noises in the press, whereas everybody else had. I didn't do that. So I took it to be a genuine thing. Little did I know that three weeks afterwards, a book from a former prime minister would come out saying what it said. 
it's easy to look back on that. I didn't have that facility. I wasn't able to do that. Now, it seems like I was taken for a fool. So that was three weeks later that you found out, yeah? Yeah, that Gordon Brown's book come out, and I now feel as though I was used a bit dim, mm. quite possibly, but I can live with that. What I am is straight down the line and honest, and I really do wish people in high places would afford me that courtesy. I've got nothing to hide, have they? So you met him, finally, Tony yeah, Blair? Yeah, absolutely. How was that, meeting him face to face? I actually found the bloke personable and pleasurable company, to be quite honest with you. Well, he's good at that. Well, <laughs> that's a really huge thing for me to get my head around, that yeah. he's quite possibly sat the other side of his table thinking, look at this idiot, let's put the carrots on the stick and lead him down the road. You know, You Bob, tell uh, me. You, you know tell the, me. The Bob Monkhouse... Uh, saying that once you can fake the sincerity, the rest is easy. I'm afraid uh, Mr. Blair is an actor supreme. Uh, but I think that the, the act is beginning to wear thin. Well, it's probably better I don't answer that on, yeah. on, on, <laughs> on, on in this programme, uh, because you can probably guess it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you make up your mind. Did George Bush know that Tony Blair was going around the country lying to the British people and the British Parliament and the British Queen. Did he know? And did Mr Blair therefore fall victim to a manipulative, deceitful, evil genius called George W Bush? Or were they in it together? That's the question here. Do you feel mugged? Do I feel mugged? I feel extremely mugged and I feel let down that that conversation I had with Alex the last time I saw him, which was the Thursday before he went away and never came back, contained a complete load of garbage because I'd swallowed things which maybe I should have been more clued in to do that. And it's all coming out now after 11 years. And if that's the best the British establishment could do, George, Something's wrong. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark, said Hamlet, <laughs> and said we here on the Sputnik. Bill Stewartson, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure.